really exciting part of it is that with some of the newer techniques that we've just developed recently in our lab, when we apply these newer approaches for improving the material quality, we're able to take that same material up to minority carrier lifetimes in excess of 150 microseconds. Okay, by the time you get to 150 microseconds, you're able to make solar cells above 20% efficiency. And this is using you know, really cheap UMG type silicon. So there's enormous potential there in the future that if the cell technologies can be developed in conjunction with the materials that are being developed, it gives you so much more opportunity for optimization of the whole scenario to come up with something that is superior to doing the two independently. Because what the UMG companies constantly complain about to us is that they say they produce these new materials that are much cheaper but lower in quality. And they give them to all the solar cell manufacturers to try. The solar cell manufacturers come back and say, hey, we normally get 16% efficiency. With your material, we're only getting 14 or 14.5% 14 efficiency. Therefore, it's no good. We're not going to use it. You've got to get us 16% efficiency or we won't use it. So the companies go back and they put all this extra effort into making the material a bit purer. So they send more to the company, and this time the company gets 15 to 15 and a half, and they're getting a bit more excited. And so they say, yeah, yeah, look, do a little bit better if you can get it to say, 15 and a half, so it's only half a cent worse than normal, then we'll start using your material. So the company does more work, purifies it a bit more, gets the 15 and a half percent efficiency. The company then that makes the solar cells is very excited. They're now getting 15 and a half compared to 16 out of the normal semiconductor grade material. They say, this is great. How much will this material cost? And they go, oh, this will cost, oh dear, it's more expensive than the semiconductor grade silicon. And this is the problem that's happening. People are making this low quality, low cost silicon, but the cell manufacturers are not willing to adapt their processes to suit the materials. They're saying to the companies, look, we've got our solar cell manufacturing process, your material has to be able to achieve certain efficiencies in our manufacturing process or we won't use it. And that's a huge mistake because you have to adapt your solar cell fabrication processes to suit the requirements of the material if you want to be able to use these cheap, lower quality materials. And we've shown how effective that can be by that simple example that I gave you a few moments ago. But the trouble is other companies at the moment are not doing that. The two are happening separately. People are purifying the silicon totally separately from the people developing the cell technologies. And I think that's a big mistake and I think we will see that gradually change over the coming decade where people will find that there's more and more value to redevelop their solar cell technologies to suit these low cost, lower purity materials that are able to be produced by quite a few companies now that they're calling UMG type silicon. Because what's happening is that we're kind of getting this almost new um, occupation for photovoltaic en engineers springing up whereby each time one of these big installations like this is being contemplated, you know, we're talking about billion dollar installations now. Okay, it's now getting up to billions of dollars. You know, if, if you're putting in, you know, a, a 400 megawatt system, you're putting in a system that is going to cost more than a billion dollars. And on the three trips I've made to the US in the last 12 months, one was for a 400 megawatt installation, one was for a 200 megawatt and the other one was a bit ill defined because it was going to be going in lots of stages. But, um, you know, when you're talking about such big dollars at stake in the order of a billion dollars, it means that the companies involved, what they, what they do is they are now enlisting a team of experts from wherever they can source them to come in and provide them with the best advice they can possibly get on which way they should be heading with regard to their technology selection. Now this has never happened before and so the poor companies that are making the product, they usually send out their sales teams. Right? And the sales teams are having to advise companies on you know, their choice of technology and how it's to be implemented and installation. And they're now being bombarded with questions from these teams of expert consultants that are being hired by these big companies and the salespeople haven't got a clue how to answer these questions. And so what it's forcing the manufacturers to do is that if they want to be involved in these bidding processes, they have to put together their own expert teams of consultants, and then you have these two teams of consultants doing battle with each other 
and you get the company and you get the manufacturer there kind of just looking on at this battle that's going, that's taking place. And then each set of consultants are providing their own advice to the respective companies. So it's quite an interesting thing that has just evolved in the last 12 months. But I suppose it's, it's a sign of things to come. And so now what we're finding is the companies that want to be involved in these utility scale applications, and there's probably about three or four of these companies that are dominating these types of applications um, around the world. Um, the, the two companies that have won most of these utility scale applications to date um, have been First Solar with a thin film product and SunTech Power with a crystalline silicon product. So they've both been very successful at winning these types of tenders. But more, increasingly, we are finding now that the solar cell manufacturers can't just use sales teams in the way they have in the past. They actually have to have expert engineers and technologists as part of their sales team. A solar cell will pretty much last forever if you properly protect it from the environment. And so when we're looking at the life expectancy of, of a solar panel, usually what we're really evaluating is how effectively the encapsulation will protect that solar cell from the environment. And in the long term, you know, solar panels that we made in 1980 on Australia's first solar cell production line, most of those are working as well today as the day they were made. Now that's 30 years ago. Um, and, and so that particular technology is turning out to be very, very durable. And there's probably no reason why those same solar panels won't be working just as well in another 30 years. Um, the trouble is, you know, manufacturers are already giving warranties of like 25 years. And, you know, probably the only reason they're not giving warranties of 50 years is because no one around today has been making modules long enough to even know if modules can survive 50 years.